Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. Here is Pastor Arnold. Chapel, welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word again. Chapter 10, the book of Zechariah. Zechariah in the Hebrew tongue, remembered of Yah. Meaning that our Father remembers us, and it has to do, it actually historically covered a seven year period. And I think that symbolizes the last seven years, which as we know has been shortened considerably. And in Zechariah, you kind of get an overlay of how it's going down, and therefore there's no surprises in it for you. We, have, we had begun in the 10th chapter, and I would remind you again that many people would say, the latter rain. I never have any of the latter rain. Well, never forget the first two words of this chapter. Ask ye. If you don't do your part, forget it, friend. You've got to meet the conditions that God sets forth. You have to at least ask Him. And, and you might say, well, what does that do? Well, it acknowledges that you believe He exists. It acknowledges the fact that if you ask, He knows you're expecting to receive, most likely. He certainly knows whether you're sincere or not. So, there are always many conditions in our Father's Word, and you have to do your part or, hey, tough. That's the way our Father operates. Though He loves you, He expects you to do your part. He continued on with the flock, and He changed that flock in the end times into war horses, not lambs any longer, but people that are capable of doing His work, of witnessing for Him, and doing it boldly. So with that thought, we had uh, just learned they were in streets. They were, uh, if you would, they tread down their enemies in the mire of the street in the battle and they shall fight. Why? Because the Lord is with them. The Lord gives us the victory. So with that having been said, verse 6, chapter 10, a word of wisdom from Yeshua, Jesus, and it reads, And I will strengthen the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph. That's the ten tribes that went north. That's all the tribes, meaning Israel. But do note that up to the last minute, the houses are still separate. And I will bring them again to place them, for I have mercy, to say love, upon them. And they shall be as though I had not cast them off. For I am the Lord their God and will hear them. Meaning, I will answer them. And naturally, that is when they are meeting his approval, doing as his word uh, states that they should do for to, to have that audience with him. All right? you, hey, if you're biblically illiterate and you don't know how to communicate with the Father or what he has asked you to do, I'm sorry. It's nice that you're a believer, but it's pretty hard to use someone on a very technical, highly classified job like serving our Father if you're ignorant about what it is He would have you do. He kind of likes for you, and that's why He wrote this letter to you personally. It's for you to absorb it. See that you do. Verse 7. And they of Ephraim, that's the ten tribes, because He was the larger thereof, shall be like a mighty man. I would rather have translated this from the hero as, I'm sorry, from the Hebrew as hero. He will be a hero, all right? And their heart shall rejoice as through wine. In other words, um, it will be one war that there will not be sadness. Why? Because we're winning souls. That's what we're doing. We're bringing alive, spiritually dead souls. Maybe souls that think they believe, but are absolutely uh, unaware of what our Father intends to do in the final generation, as whereby they could be a little useful 
if in as much as he warns in many places, behold, I have foretold all things through the prophets. And as when Jesus would be asked a question, he would say, haven't you read? Boy, that's the right answer to many people today when they ask some questions. It's in the, haven't you read? You've never read the letter God sent to you? So Ephraim will be like a hero and their heart shall rejoice as through wine mean because it's going to be a happy work. Yea, their children shall see it and be glad their heart shall rejoice in the Lord to see that discipline in families that even children take joy in that discipline of uh, seeing that stand against Satan, against the false teachers, and making that bold stand for God unashamedly. Verse 8, I will hiss for them. This is a, a, an old term taken from beekeepers. I mean, I'll whistle for them. God said, I'll urge them on. I will even call them at that time and gather them, for I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have increased. In other words, as they were before. It's going to be just like it was in the old times. Now, again, who does this talk about? The overcomers. And again, I want you to note that here they're, he's calling them horses of battle, not lambs. All right? So that means, as it's stipulated in the 14th verse of the last chapter, Ephra, uh, Judah is my bow and Ephraim is my arrow. In other words, there are things he expects people to accomplish for our Lord and Savior. I mean, he accomplished a great deal for us. Can you make a stand for him? Or are you going to run like the rest did on crucifixion day just because of a little adversity, adversity in this generation? I would hope not. Verse 9, And I will sow them among the people. He didn't say he was going to scatter them this time. That's a big difference, and I want you to absorb it. Remember back the names in the Hebrew tongue of the book of Hosea, which means salvation, that Jezreel, meaning I will sow. Uh, Jezreel also means I will scatter. The scatter was the sending out. And lo ruhama and ruhama. Lo ruhama, meaning I will not pity her, but ruhama, I love her. Ami and lo ami. Ami, my people. Lo ami, not my people. So pick up on the word so here, or you haven't done your homework in the Minor Prophets. In other words, he's going to sow his elect in a scattered sense well enough because when you sow good seed, it always brings forth much fruit. You got it? That's the work. And I will sow them among the people and they shall remember me in far countries and they shall live with their children and turn again. What does it mean, live with their children? Well, there are a lot of people that are pumping through the old heart, but they're not really living for they are eternally dead until the truth comes into them and then through the sowing and the planting of the seed, life, that is to say, live with them eternally, eternal life. We have a very short span in this earth age. Make the best of it. Verse 10. I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria. And I will bring them into the land of Gilad and Lebanon and place shall not be found for them. What does that mean? It mentions these more or less the larger places of captivity, but the sowing means of the world. So you understand we're talking about the final generation and the that Egypt and Lebanon would be an analogy in as much as the cedars of Lebanon uh, to the north are symbolic of our people, meaning that there would be so many when they were gathered in that the city as we know it, Jerusalem, could not hold them. Verse 11, And he shall pass, he who, Ephraim, that's the ten tribes, shall pass through the sea with affliction. That means distress. They'll, they're, little distress falls on their lives, but hey, they can cut it. They can handle it. A little stress doesn't bother them because they know where it comes from. 
And in God's faith, they know they can stand. They know they can handle it. And, shall, and, and uh, Ephraim shall smite the waves in the sea and all the deeps of the river, the Nile, shall dry up and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. Why? There's only going to be one king at that time. The, I mean, a scepter stands for lordship. There will only be one lord, and that's the lord of lords, the king of kings. And it states that a little adversity will not bother God's workers. Why? He told you back in verse 5, I am with you. That's why they can tromp the enemy into the mire of the street. God is with us. Understand that when spiritual life is brought into those that are spiritually dead. You have the fulfillment of Ezekiel chapter 37 where Ezekiel was prophesying, that means preaching to the dead heads, dry bones, deader than a hammer spiritually. And when we look around at our cities today, when you read tomorrow's headlines, you can rest assured they would have to be spiritually dead for the criminal acts and the moral uh, decay of children killing children and so on and so forth in this nation that the mass in part is spiritually dead. You drive God out of schools and kids don't know how to react. They'll start listening to them to what they are taught and it's usually some comic strip or cartoon where they're mowing a bunch of people down. What do you expect? Garbage in, garbage out. It's what goes in that comes out. You young people, and I know there are many, many, never let anyone tell you that you can't pray in school. You knowing and being wise enough to know that our Father, you don't have to speak out loud for your Father to know what you're saying. And no one, no one can prevent you in silence from asking Father to guide you on a test uh, a day's work, a, a time of stress. Just, just be wiser than the serpent and don't tell anyone. Pray. No one. They can pass all the laws they want to and they cannot prevent a Christian child from praying. And God will hear you. Now, the thing is, again, you're wiser than the serpent. You don't go up to the teacher and say, guess what? I slipped, I sneaked a little prayer in your class. Right? Maybe she would understand and maybe she wouldn't, so you, you only want God to hear it anyway because we should pray in silence at a time like that. Do it. You don't have to worry. Truth sets you free because it gives you the intelligence to know that nobody can prevent you from communicating with your father. They're too dumb for that, okay? They can't control that. Verse 12. And I will strengthen them in the Lord, and they shall walk up and down in his name, saith the Lord. They're going to take charge. That's why you hear me say oftentimes, we're taking ground. We're not giving it up. Why? Because the Lord is with us. He blesses us. He, the reason we experience such phenomenal growth is because God blesses those that make the stand, that teach his word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby it is God's word that is being taught and explained uh, instead of men's traditions. You really learn something that way. You grab food uh, from the table of the Lord that sticks to your ribs and makes a man, woman, or child of God out of you. They're not second-class citizens. They're God's best for because the Lord is with them. Verse 5, remember? Don't ever forget. Chapter 11, verse 1, and it reads, Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire might devour thy cedars. That, that means go ahead, open the gates. And you can look at this in two ways. <clears throat> the cedars of Lebanon have always stood for our people. As a matter of fact, in in uh, the Minor Prophets, you'll remember how God himself would say, I am a great fir tree. That's why the evergreen is symbolic of eternal life. 
Um, so with God quoting that, you have the tree of life, which is the tree that symbolizes Jesus Christ himself uh, in, uh, in the sense of an analogy. So a fire in natural timber is a healthy thing because it cleans out the underbrush. It gets rid of the junk, all right, if you want to call it that, the overgrowth that will take over if you give it an opportunity. It's healthy for it to be burned occasionally. So you can look at it in either way you choose. Uh, but you know what it really means? God's judgment's hitting town. You might as well open the gate because that's where judgment starts. The gate is returned as the judgment seat in many places. Two, howl fir tree for the cedar is fallen because the mighty are spoiled. Who are the mighty? Well, in this sense, you're going to find out it's the preachers, all right? The priest. Howl, O ye oaks of Bashan, that's where the, the largest grew, for the forest of the vintage is come down. That is to say, the forest that you thought was inaccessible is coming down. In other words, certainly... Uh, the cedar, if it fell, you know, the little oaks certainly would not have a prayer. Verse 3. There is a voice of the howling of the shepherds. That's to say the rulers, chief preachers, head muckety duck, all right? For their glory is spoiled. A voice of of the roaring of young lions for the pride of Jordan is spoiled. In other words, it's lacking the fake shepherds, preachers, to a young lion that had all the lush undergrowth along the Jordan to hide in so that when the game came by, they could jump out and kill them. And what it's saying here, the inaccessible holy of holies that the false shepherds built for themselves that they could preach from the traditions of men rather than the word of God that they're, they are made uh, to stand in the open and stripped where people can see what they're trying to do meaning simply judgment starts at the pulpit friend I tell you this that's why that I will never teach God's word to gain popularity or to please men but rather to please God and all men that understand God's word and are led by it will be pleased within that. Your, my advice is always be popular with God and good men will understand that. The others you don't need anyway. God's word is not hard up for doers. There are a lot of doers in this world, but you've got to want to do it yourself. You've got to want to serve him yourself. Well, I thought all I had to do was just believe. Well, why do you think he wrote these chapters? It has to do with the millennium and the last day of this age. Don't say it's past. If, it, if you do, you've been listening to too many yo-yos. One verse reverence. Verse 4. Thus saith the Lord my God, feed the flock of the slaughter. This is wonderful. In other words, take those poor, miserable, wretched-looking sheep that are not war horses. All they are is the, oh, dear God, I'm the little lamb of Jesus. Now, there's nothing wrong with being mellow when mellow is called for. But when he wants a war horse, he wants a war horse. He said, go ahead and feed them the truth. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. There'll be some that will listen. But um, they're destined. You see, it says feed the flock of the slaughter. You know what that means? They're destined to die if they don't change because they're going to be deceived. Why will they be deceived? Because they're biblically illiterate. Verse 5. Whose possessors slay them. That's the false preachers, all right? The false priest is what God is talking about here. And hold themselves not guilty. They probably don't even know that they are. You know, it is amazing that inasmuch as there are two 
to Christ's coming that is taught so plainly that a fifth grader can understand it. And it isn't taught in Christian communities on any scale anyway. And the first so-called Christ that appears is the spurious Messiah that is well written, taught by Christ on the Sermon of the Mount. And most people are taught in such a way that they're ready to fly away with him. The first one that comes, and that was what Jesus warned about in Mark 13. If they say he's in the desert, don't believe it, for the false Christ shall come first. How, do, how can they manage to mislead people in such mass? Well, I don't know. I guess Satan has a good thing going for him, does he not? Because you do have preachers that say, you don't have to understand the book of Revelation. You're going to be gone. Anytime a preacher sets him up as being smarter than God, for God wrote it, the word revelation means to uncover. He wanted it uncovered for you. Then, I don't know, you'd believe anything. You'd, I could sell you the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge, you know, on, on easy payments. Whose oppressors slay them. Why? Because they, they, if you don't teach someone what God's word states and in place you teach traditions of men, you bring them to a spiritual death with good intentions. It's no wonder that they don't feel guilty according to the traditions of men. They're doing a good job. And they sh that sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich. And their own shepherds pity them not. Uh-uh. They sell their birthright. This is the reason God hated Esau and loved Jacob. Malachi chapter 1 or, or um, Acts, uh, chap, uh, Romans chapter 9, whichever place you wish to put it to find out why God hated Esau. He didn't care about his heritage or God. And he would rather listen to men. Verse 6. I want you to remember those that sell them. Remember that terminology. That's part of the subject. Verse 6. For I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. Woo, that's heavy, friend. He's not going to pity them. Do, do you remember the rohama? That's what that word is in the Hebrew. Not pitied. But lo, I will deliver the men, every one, into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king. Notice that king is not uppercase. It's not our king. And they shall smite the land, and out of their hand I will not deliver them. What he's saying is, after they've been taught, if they refuse to hear, if they want to kill each other, let them have at it. All right? If they want to get involved in, in, in a bunch of malarkey and traditions rather than in my word, let them kill each other. In other words, I will allow it. God does not take part in it, neither do you. But if that's what they want, he will let it happen. <clears throat> it is too bad that we have places called houses of God. And the house of God should teach God's word, right? I mean, it isn't, doesn't that make sense to you? Isn't that what it's for? But how many people many times only get one verse out of a full hour? And mostly not what's written in context, but what men have to say. Think about it. That's why they feel no guilt. It sounds so religious. But Christianity is not a religion. It's a reality. Now, you're going to have to sharpen up for me. Listen carefully. Verse 7. And I will feed the flock of slaughter. Those that are spiritually dead and probably are not going to make it for the eternity. Even you, O poor of the flock. And I took unto me two staves. The one I called beauty and the other I called bands. And I fed the flock. Now, this is beautiful. Do you know who this is? Of course, naturally, beauty is, um, it means loveliness or um, compassion. And bands means union. It's talking about Jesus Christ. It's going to send that Savior. But one thing you might... I want you to be sure that you check me out on this. I want you to, if you can, you prove me wrong. 
The terminology, O poor of the flock, one Hebrew word was translated as two to come up with poor of the flock. The Septuagint has it right. It says Kenites. Okay? The word Kenite or Canaanite in the Hebrew tongue means a trafficker or a merchant. And you with companion Bibles, Dr. Bullinger naturally spotted it. The same word, to document what, the, the same, he translates it, traffickers of the sheep. That means they sell sheep. They sell people's souls into hell, quite frankly. Now, the same word for you that possess manuscripts, you will find in the last verse of the book of Zechariah, you will find that this same word, poor of the flock, sheep traffickers, is translated Canaanites. Okay? So now let's read it like it should be read and properly translated and uh, so that you clearly understand what is said. I will feed the flock of the slaughter, those that are at this time spiritually dead, with Christ's death on the cross, opening repentance to the people, that price paid, he would feed them. O poor of the flock is, O you sheep traffickers, and I took unto me two staves, the one I call beauty and the other I call bands, and I fed the, the flock. That means Christ fed them. Is it any wonder that the Kenites wanted to have Christ crucified? Because he was the one that fed the sheep, gave them the truth, whereby they could pull free. Verse 8. Three shepherds also I cut off in one month. Again, I don't have to tell you what shepherds are, do I? The, the word pastor, pastor comes from the word pasture. Pasture is where the sheep are supposed to be fed. That's why people carry the title pastor, because they're supposed to be shepherds. They're supposed to feed the, the children God's word, not man's. Three shepherds also I cut off in one month, and my soul loathed them. God doesn't like them. And their soul also abhorred me. Do you know who these three were? You want me to tell you? The priest, the magistrates, and the false prophets. It's going to fall apart for them. It is amazing to me that in as much as the word rapture is not even in the word of God, we have people enslaved to that thought, told not to worry about studying God's word. They're going to be gone. All the, and God's word says exactly the opposite. But I suppose the little shepherd succeeds if he uh, brainwashes the person to the point they don't feel that they have to have an understanding of God's word just listening to them. Now, thank God we have many good pastors in this country. We've got a lot of good preachers. We've got a lot of good priests. We've got a lot of good magistrates. Well, I don't want to say a lot of good magistrates. We've got some. We don't have any good false prophets. That's people that claim to, uh, that God speaks to them and God doesn't know them. And they're basically claimed to be a teacher and they're biblically illiterate as far as the languages of God's word is concerned. I would be very careful of one like that. God abhors them. He dislikes them. Why? It's hanky in with God's children. That's why God will feed them, and at least the person will have a final chance to make their mind up. Verse 9, Then said I, I will not feed you that, that dieth. Let it die. And that that is to be cut off, let it be cut off. And let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. If you want to destroy each other, heave to and do it. All right? That's after they're taught. If they don't know any better then, if you think God won't let it happen, if you think he won't let Christians in mass worship the false Christ in their ignorance of the fact that they think they're going to be gone when the false Christ gets here, you're mistaken. How popular do you think that you are with Christ? 
after you have worshipped Antichrist, thinking, I, well, I thought it was Jesus. The thoughts won't cut it, friend. You're playing church. You're playing Christian if you are just got thoughts. You haven't worked in your Father's Word. Verse 10, And I took my staff, picture a shepherd now, the chief shepherd, if you would, and I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder that I might break my covenant which I had made with all the people. This is a beautiful thing if you see it in its entirety because God doesn't break a covenant fini, all right? Meaning uh, forever nor will he ever. In other words, the staff and bands being Christ was crucified. That was the husband. He died. That leaves the people free to remarry and to, in the New Testament, New Covenant, the word testament is covenant, okay? Or will, if you would. And it leaves her free to remarry after repentance of sins into the New Covenant, which is still the same Old Covenant minus uh, blood ordinances and a few other things that he nailed to the cross with him, all right? In other words, uh, letting the New Testament not do away with the old, but complete it. Verse 11. And it was broken in that day. And so the poor of the flock, those sheep traffickers that waited upon me, knew that it was the word of the Lord. They knew the game was up. Verse 12. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed out, they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. You getting with it now? That's the prophecy. When Christ was crucified, Judas sold him for 30 pieces of silver. And when he found out that uh, rather than uh, that Christ was not immediately coming in as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he threw that blood money down. They took it and they bought Potter's Field. Symbolic of the fact that the 30 pieces of silver being the price of a slave bought potter's field, which is still potter's field of this day, where old pottery, of which our bodies are symbolic of our bodies, old pottery that is broken, is cast out. That he can, he, the Lord and Savior, can take that pottery and reform it, reshape it, and make a new creature by believing upon him. This is how it went down, friend, and how it's going to go down in the end. How are you fixed? Verse 13, prophecy. And the Lord said unto me, cast it into the, unto the potter a goodly price that I was pray, priced at, praised at of them. Prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Prophecy, it had to be fulfilled exactly that way. That should strengthen your faith concerning that 30 pieces of silver. And many of you have had your homes wrecked. Your bodies have been wrecked through drugs, uh, breakups, uh, business failures, and everything else. And you accept him in his word and he molds that pot, that clay body back together and makes a, and cha a changed life and a new person. It still works, my friend. That 30 pieces of silver was an awesome price that Satan had to pay because it has put together more bodies than Satan will ever be able to tear apart. How are you doing? Verse 14, And then I cut asunder my other staff, even bands, that's the union, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. And it is broken, still is. Anytime you have a, a war of two Christian nations, that's a civil war. Verse 15, And the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. He mentioned this as a bastard shepherd in the last lecture or so, meaning a mamzar, I will say it in the Hebrew, shepherd. It's talking about Antichrist, okay? For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that be cut off, 
neither shall seek the young one, that's to say the starving one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. In other words, it is so weak, its ribs are sticking out, and it's so weak it can't move, it's standing still. He won't care. When there is a starvation for truth from God's word, chapter by chapter and verse to verse, to be taught in this nation and the world, False Christ is certainly not going to care. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces with deception, with lies, with false prophets, bringing forth the, uh, the, the deception of the last days. It's here, friend. How are you doing? 17. Woe to the idle shepherd. Now, I want you to stop a moment. What is an idol? Well, uh, let me see. Uh, an idol is something somebody worships. You got it. I, I want to make certain that you understand this shepherd was one they would worship as Christ. Okay? Woe to the idol, the worshiper, a shepherd that likes to be worshipped, and he's none other than the son of perdition, that leaveth the flock, the sword shall be upon his arm. The arm is an Hebrew idiom that always means your power. And upon his right eye, that's the eye of strength that is the mirror to the soul, he says, I'm going to cut him. Cut him with what? The sword of the Lord, which is the truth. It's a two-edged sword. Revelation chapter 1 verse 16 for documentation. His arm shall be clean dried up. He will have no power and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Let me tell you something. If you are knowledgeable and you have the seal of God in your forehead, which means that you understand the overall plan of God and you've got it inside in your little brain right in there, you can't be deceived. On the contrary, those that choose to be biblically illiterate they have another seal in their forehead. It's spoken of in Revelation 13, 18. It's called the mark of the false beast, which is that same idol shepherd, which is that same Mamzar shepherd, which is the same son of perdition. For as Paul would warn and make it as clear as anyone possibly could in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, after he had written that first letter to the Thessalonians, and they, Jesus is coming, kind of going to fly us away. Paul said, don't let any man deceive you about our gathering back to Jesus Christ. It will not happen. Don't let my first letter deceive you. Don't let any angel deceive you. You can read these words. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm now in the second verse. Nor any spirit deceive you. For Christ shall not return until after the son of perdition stands in the holy place claiming to be Christ, claiming to be God. Now, I don't know, how, how, plain, how plain can we make that? Well, 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 who's the son of perdition? Well, there's only one. How many guesses do you need? If you understand the Greek, do you? Do you know what perdition means? It means to perish. There is only one entity that Almighty God has already sentenced to perish. No one else will be until after Judgment Day. There will be some that will fade away. They're called fallen angels, Nephilim in the Hebrew tongue, be that as it may. You will read of that banishment or that sentence of death to the son of perdition in Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 18 and 19 where he is called there Tyrus Tyrus in the Hebrew tongue meaning rock but not our rock the false rock which rock are you standing on I hope it's the right one because it doesn't shake if you're standing on the other he's dead already why would you follow a dead man when God warns you over and over in his word, it's time to mature as Christians and recognize religion is religion. Christianity is a reality. It's your life. It'll change you. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?